This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the niche details of modern warfare and underreported conflict with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to journalist Frederic Heerdink about how she spent a whole year living with the PKK, the Kurdish militant group, the guerrillas that are fighting the Turkish government right now in Turkey and have been for the last 40 odd years. Frederic spent a whole year living with them to find out what goes on at their Kandil mountain base on the mountain ranges of northern Iraq. If you like what we're doing here at Popular Front, please do consider supporting us at patreon.com slash popular front. So, Frederick, you you basically were living with uh, the PKK for a year, right? Um, yeah, why? Sure. Why were you doing this? Maybe just explain to us, what was this project all about? Well... Um, it emerged when I was in the Kandil Mountains, where the PKK uh, has its uh, headquarters and most of the camps. And that was two months after I was expelled from Turkey because of my work about the Kurdish issue. Um, it was very beautiful in the mountains. And um, I had good conversations. And I thought, you know, it's so good to be here, but I'm not a fighter. What can I do? And then I thought, hey, I'm a journalist, that opens opportunities. Um, so I thought maybe I can stay with the PKK for a year and then do the same thing that I've done when I was reporting in Kurdistan in Turkey, which is mostly talking to common people. I traveled a lot in cities and in villages and I didn't talk to politicians a lot, but to common people. Mm. I had interviewed the leadership of the PKK a few times already. Um, and I thought, what if I apply the same principle to the PKK and not talk to the leadership anymore, but to the common fighters and uh, get to know their lives and their aspirations, their fears, their dreams. So that's, that's how it started. Right. Um, and how did you manage to convince them to let you stay there for a whole year? Well, that was not so hard, actually. I had to convince myself to do it because I immediately shared it with the press person of the PKK. I said, I have a crazy plan. And he said, oh, we like crazy plans here. Let me hear <laughs> what it is. <laughs> um, and then, of course, he had to talk it over. And a month later, he gave me the message that I was welcome. And then... I thought, oh, now I have to um, make the decision if I'm actually going to do this, if I can do this in a journalistic way, uh, which means without their interference, without them, um, you know, interfering about what I write, who I talk to, what kind of questions I ask or don't ask. Mm -hmm. So I talked to a lot of people, to colleagues mainly. Um, and one colleague here in the Netherlands said, it would be more crazy not to do this than to do this with your background in Kurdistan and everything you know. And then I got a subsidy from a journalistic fund here in the Netherlands. And the PKK was not, um, promised not to interfere. They said the only demand we have is that you, um, that you follow safety instructions, which seemed a good plan, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was all. And I thought if, if along the way it turns out that they uh, do interfere, then I can always quit. But they didn't. So, you know, I stayed the full year. Right. So give us an idea of where you were staying. Obviously, you mentioned the Kandil Mountains. For anyone that doesn't know, that's essentially like a mountain base, but there are many caverns and caves and underground layers to that place. Um, maybe give us an idea of where in Kandil you were staying. What was it like? In the first three months, it was, uh, well, these are the mountains um, on the Iraq-Iran border. So Kurdistan uh, border between Iraq and Iran. Um, the first three months, I was going to a language course. So with Kirillas, who were learning their mother tongue, because in many parts of Kurdistan, you can't really learn Kurdish properly. Um, 
And then I went to camps around uh, Mahmur, that's a town outside the Kurdistan region in Iraq, um, where there is a refugee camp since the 1990s of Kurds from Turkey. I went to Kirkuk, that was still in Kurdish hands at the time, uh, to Shengal, where the PKK at the time had quite a base. And after that, I went across the border walking at night um, to Syria. And there a problem emerged because I came to the first base and they asked, what are you doing here? I said, I'm writing a book about the PKK. And I said, they said, Why, what are you doing here? There's no PKK in Syria. Right, right. Um, and I knew that. I knew how they look at this issue. So I had to talk quite a bit to to convince them that I knew what I was doing. And I said, I have, you know, permission from the, from the highest leadership here in the mountains. So, uh, eventually I convinced them. But um, so I stayed with the um, Kurdish forces in Syria as well. So the YPJ and the YPG, the women's forces, which are not the PKK, but they have the same ideology and the same ideology. ideology, ideology ideological leader of course so yeah and a lot of similar commanders as well um when you were in candle yeah. what was it like though like where were you staying in the caves or what you had like some kind of building to stay in like what was the actual surroundings like um this was a very foresty area and that was the case because it had to be hidden very well also from drone activity and under the trees uh you're invisible for drones and that was because it was a language camp and it's not very mobile. It, we had to sort of concentrate on our language for three months and on our homeworks. So it was not good if we had to, you know, um, relocate every few weeks or even days. And we were staying one person, uh, one person in a tent. So in the, in the area where they set up tents and, um, we we stayed in there and the classes were out in the open, very strategically placed. In the morning we had classes and the classrooms were in the in the shadow. So still bearable in the morning. This was in the summer. This was um June, end of June, July, August 2016. So it was very hot. So in the morning we were in the shadow. Um it was alongside a river. I don't know which one where we swam in the afternoon to cool down. And I gave, as a Dutch person, I can swim. So me and a German woman, we gave swimming lessons to the fighters because <laughs> they could swim. <laughs> it was sort of surreal because yeah. I remember that I, I couldn't, I wasn't in touch with the outside world for three months, like at all. And I told also my family, like this can happen and you shouldn't worry about me. But of course, I figured that they would be worrying. And I thought, hey, they are probably worrying that I'm, you know, close to violence or something. But meanwhile, we were sitting in a language class and swimming in the river in the afternoon and gathering fruits and, you know, these kind of things. So that was rather um, safe, relatively safe. Mm. Later, I also stayed um, in caves, in several caves, which were. Most of them much bigger than I expected. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe give us an idea then what like, you know, day to day, what does, you know, a day in the life of a, of a PKK fighter in the mountains look like? What do they do every day, you know, day in, day out? Well, what I found out is, and this sounds very obvious, but still it's important thing, uh, an important thing. It depends on their task. You know, when I was there in the language camp, the Koopa tent happened in Turkey. Mm. And I was very frustrated that I didn't have access to the news as much as I wanted to. We only had some Turkish channels and the Kurdish channel didn't pay much that much attention to it. And I was frustrated because I thought I'm here as a journalist and I need to know how, how the guerrillas deal with this. But these guerrillas don't have anything to do with that. So... How am I supposed to, you know, figure out how? But that was the, actually the thing. Many guerrillas are not directly involved 
in what is happening on a day-to-day basis in, for example, Turkey. Mm. They have their own task. And for some, is, for some it is language learning. For the others, it's, for example, I went for a few days distributing um, all kinds of stuff from petrol and munition to food and blankets and these kind of things. Um, I stayed in just, you know, camps where um, where women were develop- developing ideas for a women's uh, television station. All, there's all kinds of tasks that, that they have, and only at, at certain places at the time, and now, now these areas have broadened, but only right at the border, there was much more fighting going on, but they didn't allow me to go there. Um, I, I pressured, but they, you know, it was a safety instruction, like you can't really mm. go to where the actual fighting go, is going on. Also with the drones, it, it, it was increasingly dangerous there. Um, and I met some guerrillas before I was expelled from Turkey in, in Diyarbakir province, and they were also more involved in, um, in the actual fight. Um, but the tasks are very broad, and, and these, these are one of the things that I learned, that it is about much more than just the um, than just the armed struggle. It is it is much more about building an alternative to uh, to the circumstances that the Turks are used to to live in, in in civil society, so to speak. So there's a there's a wide range of things. But but the Gorsh Bash, Gorsh Bash is good morning. Usually comes around six breakfast at six thirty, and mm-hmm. especially when there's camps where you don't. Uh, where you're not allowed to use electricity or any light whatsoever, you 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 go to sleep. You go to your tent um, when the sun goes down. So sometimes at eight o'clock, you go to sleep. Well, b- before the before the classes started, there's a whole lot of practical things going on too. Mm. For example, before pra- before classes, there was an hour of uh, going into the vicinity and to get wood. The wood was needed for cooking and the wood was needed to make hot water for the shower. So there's a whole lot of practical things going on. Every week there was, or every two weeks, there was a group in the afternoon going to bake bread. And there was a hidden oven somewhere uh, in the forest where the bread was was made. Um, In other bases, there is uh, physical training, there is ideological education, um, cleaning of weapons, um, supplies, um, supply work like distribution, um, you, yeah, you name it, days, days fly. Because also many practical things that we do here very quickly it takes a lot, of, lot more time if you have to make a, a, a wood fire um, to cook. It takes a long time to to cook, you know. Um, you have to build new camps, so you have to make sure the water comes to the camp. So you have to dig a way to make um, to make stream come down from the mountain to have water. Um, all all kinds of things. It takes days to build a new camp, for example. So they're in, in many ways they're living very primitively um, in the mountains in Kandil. Is that just because they're worried about you know the Turkish drones, or is it more to do with ideology as well? Would you say? No, it is just like um, where they live. Like it, it is sort of people think like Kandil mountains. or there's fighting, armed struggle. But I remember. I was doing, I was washing my clothes and then a gila came to me and she said like, you know, we usually do it like this and like that and it's cleaner and and she said, you know, just because we're living in the mountains doesn't mean that we're, that we don't take proper care of ourselves or that the hygiene isn't very important. Of course it is because hospitals are not easily accessible, of course. So it is, it's a whole life. Um, it's not in any way like the men shave regularly. It's not like a wildlife or something. Yeah. There's no, they don't have a house, but it's 
they try to make a normal life as possible, even though they live in a cave or in a tent or under the trees. They make it as normal, hygienic, clean, um, yeah, normal as possible. Right, and you, you talked a little bit about the political um, training and stuff there. Maybe just give us an idea, uh, an idea of of what the PKK believes in at this point. You know, it's, what is it in the current era? Like, what do they actually believe in? What is their political ideology at the moment? Surely it's evolved. You know, you've seen it firsthand. What, what kind of things were they teaching? Well, the, the one of the things that still not everybody knows is they're, that they're not striving to build a, a nation state. Um, so they don't propose an independent Kurdish state. And many people don't believe that. They say like, yeah, they say that, but eventually they would want it. But they think that the state, the nation state is the, um, the root of many problems that the Kurds have. And also because, because nation states um, evolve around yeah, the nation that lives in that state and whichever they say, especially in the Middle East, that is historically so um, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multi-religious, whichever state you carve out is going to result in minorities. Um, and a better way to... Uh, solve the problems of the Kurds and of the wider Middle East would be to um, to respect that diversity by not making a new nation state again in which other people will be minorities next to Kurds. For example, the Christian community that, that still live there or Arab communities, Turkmen communities. It's better to organize people on a local level mm. according to um, whichever community lives there and they can make decisions about their own their own lives how how they organize do they need a kurdish language school or also an assyrian language school a turkish language language school or what kind of religious houses do they need um, so it's a it's a better solution to um, to find a model that that respects the the natural diversity of the whole region. Yeah, of course. Um, in terms of the conflict, what kind of training did you see them doing for that? Because obviously we know that you know the PKK is very much still in open uh, war with the Turkish government. We even saw, I think, this week they released like a compilation um, of clips the PKK did of them attacking Turkish military targets inside Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, maybe just give us an idea of what you saw of that side of things, the military side. Um, the military side, I spent a few days in a training for um, yeah, heavier weapons than just the average Kalashnikov, so mm. to speak. Don't ask me which weapons exactly, because <laughs> I would have to check that again. It's not really... Uh, it's, information is not really that much in me, but very much about um, getting to know your weapon very well so taking it uh, uh, deconstructing it and putting it back together blindfolded um, because of course much of the fighting is also going on at night so you need to know your weapons very well um, it's about how um, what kind of um, attacks do you do in what kind of situations? Like many people still think there's, for example, um, mines being used, landmines. Yeah. But usually these are roadside bombs. Um, and they're not put on the road, but underneath the road. So it takes a lot of time to dig and to get underneath the road and to put the explosives there. I also saw the explosives uh, used to, to build new caves, by the way. Um, and there's people going on sniper training. I met one woman who was actually at the conservatory in, uh, in Istanbul. Um, she was studying cello and now she was sent to, uh, to, a, to a sniper training. Um, yeah, these kind of trainings I saw. When when um when you spoke to them about the conflict, 
Um, what is their kind of response? Where's their head at right now? Well, they are very, um, they're always very confident and saying, like, because at the moment, of course, the pressure is high because of the armed drones. And it was not at the time I was there in 16 and 17. It was not all armed drones yet. And at the moment, it's much more. And that gives really a lot of pressure. Because when I was there, you could still, you got, for example, a warning, like warplanes are leaving now from Diyarbakir and it will take 15 or 18 minutes to get here. So if we hear them coming, then maybe they are coming to us and then you have time to hide or to run up the mountain or take some precaution. And currently that doesn't really exist anymore. Like the drone um, detects you and 10 seconds later you're dead. There's no communication first to get a, a bomber to to bomb you. So the pressure is up. But they see it very much as another technological um, development that they will need to adjust to, but that will never um, that will never bring a victory to Turkey. And I actually think that's true because even if you would kill all the fighters, that doesn't mean that the Kurdish issue is solved. Um, but they also see it as a, you know, there's there's different struggles actually. <clears throat> like you have the you have the armed struggle, but the bigger struggle is the ideological struggle. And to to um, the, their idea is also for them the nation state and capitalism are very much connected to each other. Um, both patriarchal systems, mm. and they say. Capitalism is going to fall. It's inev inevitable because it's not compatible with, with human life. It's destroying the planet and it's not compatible. So eventually capitalism will fall and we are um, building an alternative. And one of the fighters told me, like maybe, um, because I asked them often, like, what, what do you expect to to achieve in your lifetime. And he said like, and more fighters said that, it's not about what can be reached in my lifetime. Maybe capitalism will fall after PKK doesn't exist anymore. And maybe there's other groups who have taken over the struggle, maybe here, maybe elsewhere in the world. But we are, we are laying foundations for that, that other groups, other people, or the fighters after us can build up, build, build on again. Um, so that is the larger struggle that that they all have in the back of their minds, and they're saying like the weapons um, are now for self defense and not necessarily to attack, and we need them for self defense. That that is our right to mm -hmm. to to defend ourselves, but the struggle is is much bigger than that. And that, that was one of the things um, I learned and that also helped me because when I was in Turkey between uh, 2013 and 2015, there was a sort of peace process going on. And I was thinking, what if, what if this um, actually leads to peace? And that a solution to this problem is found. What am I going to do then as a journalist? I thought maybe I can live for a year in, in, a, in a town on the Black Sea coast in Turkey, which is known for being very nationalist. What well, nationalist everywhere, but the Black Sea coast is sort of known for it. Mm. I thought they, their identity will have to change too. Their way of looking at their country needs to change too. And I found that sort of inspiring like the things I could do when peace would break out. You know? And then the peace process ended and I was kicked out of Turkey. And I thought, oh, I'm not, never going to write about the peace. But then I thought, after several fighters told me this, like it's much bigger than that. And we're trying to, trying to build foundations for, for new society. I thought, hey, that's actually interesting. I'm, I, can, I can watch this being built and 
you know, generations from now, maybe they will look at this time, they will look back at this group, at what's happening here in this region of the world as something, um, as a place where something started. And that, and that turned out to be inspiring for me to be there. And that is very, um, make, how do you say that in English? Uh, megaloman a little bit. Uh, but that is the, but that is their perspective, you know. Yeah. And I was there for a whole year, so you get in sort of their mood too about seeing this broader, bigger perspectives all the time. And I found that very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, did they did they speak much about Rajava? Obviously, I know they say, "Oh, there's no PKK fighters in Rajava." It's like, yes, there are. Like, you know what I mean? Everybody knows. Um, but did they did they speak much about Rajava? Like, were they open about that or or what? I mean, I imagine it's a massive thing for them still. You know what I mean? Yeah, it is. And um, about that, like, there's PKK in Rojava. Well, the, the thing is, like, when you um, when you're in Kandil as a fighter and you get a task to go to Rojava, then the moment you cross the border and you go, come into Syria, you're not a PKK fighter anymore because you have a different task and you're with another group, with another, um, you know, in Rojava, the SDF or the YPJ, they are the, um, not the only armed group. Now Turkey is there too. Um, the, the Assad regime has some presence still, but they are the um, openly the armed forces in control there. And the PKK is not like that. The PKK is a guerrilla group, so they have a different, totally different task. Right, but that's just symbolic. I mean, that's swapping a patch and doing a different task. It, you know, it doesn't yeah, mean you're not a part of the same group. Not, you have a, it's a it's a different group with a different task. I, I disagree. I disagree. I mean, if if a PKK, a HPG commander who I have met personally in Rojava leading a YPG unit to then say, oh, they're nothing to do with the PKK anymore. I mean, it's just not true. You know what no, I mean? No, no, no. But that's something else. It's not like it, they have nothing to do with the PKK. They have something yeah. to do with the PKK. Of course, they have the same yeah, ideology. Exactly, yeah. They have the same leader. But it's a different group. Like the YPG doesn't do guerrilla actions from Syrian soil into Turkey. They are not guerrilla fighters. They Their task is to protect the 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 borders and the safety of Rojava like on the ground they walk there openly with their weapons while the PKK in Turkey and and in Kandil have a different task to attack the Turkish army that's not the task of a YPJ fighter so in that of course they have something to do it's not like oh PKK never heard of of course that's nonsense yeah yeah it's no, a I, different I, group with a different task so it's more than 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 that's why I agree like PKK is not in Syria. They have something to do with each other, but it's a different group with a different task. And what do the guerrillas in Kandil, like, how do they speak about Rojava? I mean, they must find it amazing, right? Because what they've done there in, what, nine years now, like, it's incredible by anyone's standards. Like, what, what's their response to it? Yeah, it's very, it's very inspiring. And people really wanted to... Um, People wanted to go and also to, you know, people often want to fight. Even also when I was in Rojava, um, and not all the camps are busy fighting, you know. Yeah, yeah. So there were also people pressuring their commanders, let me get to the front in Raqqa. But not everybody can go to the front in Raqqa, you know. But there was a really a very deep will to fight ISIS um, but um, it also changes because um, of course after 2015 the peace process in Turkey was over and many of the guerrillas I talked to in Kandil were not necessarily aspiring to go to Rojava because you can also get a more uh, yeah, a task that is not directly fighting, like manning a checkpoint or, you know. More people were applying to go to Bakur, as they say. So North Kurdistan, Kurdistan in Turkey. For guerrilla Because, war. yeah, to, to, to fight the Turkish army there. Mm -hmm. And also I talked to a fighter who was herself from, uh, from Rojava. 
um, but she um, she came to Kandil for her military training, ideological training. And she said, of course, Rojava is my home, um, but I do want to go to Bakuri because I think there's an important war going on there now too. So in general, I found that the fighters, um, you know, you have to do your language course and ideological course, all very important, etc. But they do want to go to where, where the fighting is because of course the hate against ISIS was so big. And and the urgency of the of the struggle against Turkish arms, yeah, the urgency is high. So, yeah, totally. Um, is there anything specifically that surprised you about uh, living with the PKK? Perhaps something you didn't know about them, or something you you know you didn't know how it would work. Something that surprised you out there? Well, what um, what was difficult to adjust to was, and I didn't expect that at all. Um, and I've written that in the first chapter of, chapter of my book as well, is sort of the, the slowness of the revolution. They call it the uh, revolution that they're making, not just in Rojava, but their whole ideology, their whole goal. Um, and of course, I'm a journalist and I came, um, when I went there, it was 10 months, nine or 10 months after Turkey kicked me out. And I was still... Also in Turkey, I was always, you know how it goes, always following the news. Mm -hmm. Which commander is saying what? Uh, what is going on in Ankara and Parliament today? What did Erdogan say? What does the American president say? How is this all? And you have to follow. And if you sleep and you wake up and you check what's happening. And there, often you have no access. And that frustrated me because I came as a journalist and I wanted to, to, to see, like, how do they react to everything that's happening? And I didn't even know it was happening. <laughs> so it was very frustrating. Also, there was one time, there was one uh, guerrilla that helped me to travel from A to B. Um, and at, at some point, I, I, I'm sort of impatient. And I try to be patient, but at some point I, I said to him, you have to now help me to get to B because, you know, I'm Thank in a hurry. Yeah. And um, I tried to pressure him a little bit by saying, come on, I'm trying to write a good book about you. And, you know, if you don't get me to B, how am I going to get a good book? And he said, oh, there are so many bad books about PKK already. We can add another one. No problem. <laughs> 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 and he laughed about it too. It was a joke. Yeah. But it was also very revealing about, about their confidence. Also, that they never asked me, what are you going to ask? Why do you want to go there? What are you going to write about? It's never, ever, ever. You know, if I write a shit book, that's my problem, not theirs. And they're very confident. And, um, and that I had to adjust to the, the slowness and like um, and I didn't expect that because as a journalist you're you're in another pace. Yeah. Um, and of course the, the leadership I was uh, one time I had an uh, interview appointment with somebody in the KCK 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 leadership, the umbrella organization. Mm -hmm. And that was cancelled because some news in Turkey, I don't recall what, and there was an, an urgent meeting or something. Um, but in general, it was all much slower and much more detached from, from the everyday craziness of the news that I expected and that I wanted to in the beginning. Eventually, I, I learned to, to let it go and, and adjust to the pace of, of their struggle. And, and that was very valuable, I think. If I had just stayed for a month or three months, I, I wouldn't have been able to adjust and, and paint a less proper picture. No, definitely. Um, it's funny you say that about, you know, speaking openly. I found as well when I met with, um, so HPG, I met with like PKK guerrillas in, uh, in Selopi. 
And they were like, you yeah. know, hard, hard guerrillas. You know, they were actively in open conflict. They were building bombs, all sorts. And they were incredibly open. You know, I just went there and was like, look, can we talk to them? They were like, yeah, like, sure. Like, they didn't say, don't ask this, don't go there. They were like, they were just like, look, you're at your own peril. You might die here, but, you know, we're not going to stop you. And I was like, wow, that's, that was quite interesting. You know what I mean? I thought that was yeah. specifically for a militant group, quite refreshing as well. Um, yeah. One one thing I wanted to ask you as well, what's what's the kind of military hierarchy or structure looking like these days in Kandil? Um, did you get any kind of insight into that? Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, because when I came to a new camp, I couldn't always figure out who the commander was. And sometimes it was a more... Um, like not not necessarily the most um, expressive or natural leadership kind of yeah. person. Sometimes it was more like a, you know, sometimes I couldn't really figure it out. And I was looking for two days, like who's the commander, you know? But that is more, um, of course, when there's really a war situation, when there's actual fighting going on, it's very clear who the commander is. And that happened to me when I tried to get as close as possible to the fight in Raqqa. And then I clashed with a commander because she, she wouldn't let me. <laughs> um, but in the in the camps where more of daily life is going on, it's more one one commander explained it to me like she said, my task is to make sure that people take their responsibilities themselves. And I don't want to tell them what to do. I want them to switch the TV off themselves and to right. take a book and to discuss the book they're reading together. I want them to notice themselves that, you know, the, the cave needs cleaning, um, you know, or whatever needed to be done. So in, in, the more daily life situations, the commander has such a task and not ordering people around at all. Um, but when I came to Raqqa and I wanted to get, you know, to where the actual fighting was, um, I talked to this commander and she said, yeah, you can go to a hospital, like a mobile hospital. Mm. And she sent me to one, but it was far behind the front line. And that was, of course, not what I wanted. And I talked again. And she kept saying that she didn't have time. And then the fighters saw me struggling with her. And they said, you have to talk to this commander or that commander. They advised me to talk to other people. But it all pointed back to that one woman. She was in charge and it was on her. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't get around her. Um. And eventually, I also thought I have to try to get to that front line as far as possible, also for my readers. Because if I don't explain to my readers properly that I didn't reach the Raqqa front line, then they will be left with questions. Mm. You know, why didn't she go further? So I pressured her. Um, and she said, you're taking too much of my time, never shouting. Everybody's always very polite. Yeah. Which helped, which helped me to stay polite and not to <laughs> shout <laughs> and lose my patience. But she said at a certain point, but we are planning a war here. And I said, but I'm writing a book. Like, you know, th those two goals just couldn't come together. Yeah. And she said, you either go to the base behind here, where, again, fighters were, you know, putting beads on their shells and cleaning and doing things like that. Or you go back to Kobani because we can't have you here, you know, walking around and pressuring us. And I didn't want to go to a, to a base behind the front line again. So I was brought back to Kobani like instantly, like two minutes later, there was a car to drive me away. Um, so that in, that, in, in such cases, it's very clear, but also very um, 
the conversation doesn't really get nasty or something. But I couldn't get around this one commander. She was in charge and nobody else. There was no way to, to, to sneak to the front line in any other way. And that was different, I think, because you were in Silopi and also I also uh, I lived in Diyarbakir, of course, and I've also in uh, Suruj during the Kobani War. I've seen youth with their Molotov cocktails and, and making bombs and things. Um, and then you come there as an outsider journalist. And then you're welcome to be with them. But now I, the PKK was responsible for me. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I could not... So I was, in a way, frustrated about that, of course, because I wanted to get more to the front line. On the other hand, I remember when I was in PKK bases um, earlier, for example, around Kirkuk, I had been before. I wanted to sneak into the to the living parts of the military base, but they wouldn't allow me. <laughs> and now I got access to all the places that that I would never have access to as as somebody coming from the outside. Um, did did the uh, did the fighters, the guerrilla, did they ask you anything? Like, were they interested about you know the outside world, as it were? Well, in a rather rudimentary way, actually. Um, very very daily kind of conversations, and sometimes um, I remember them like sort of analyzing capitalist society and me getting a little bit annoyed because I thought you've never been there. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, but then again, you're rather accurate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also very, very normal everyday life questions. Like, is it true that you, as, that young people leave their parents' house before they get married or, you know, very basic questions. Yeah. Also. Um, but also sometimes conversations about feminism, like how do you look at somebody like Hillary Clinton or Angela Merkel? Are they really your feminist icons? And if I say that many women do say that, you know, their examples, they laugh very hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you find, I found that as well, right? So I was in uh, Ainisa, in uh, the a new YPJ yeah. military base. And we got onto yeah. the subject of feminism and genealogy. And they were saying, like, they were really very quite disturbed by Western feminism. Um, it sounds yeah. to me like that's a similar conversation you had. Yeah, very much. Very often also. What were their critiques? Uh, well, that that's... Um, much of the feminism in the West is about um, um, finding a place in the patriarchy and by doing that, strengthening the patriarchy instead of breaking it down. And I have to agree. Um, and they have a, like one, one of the fighters asked me, and that was kind of a funny conversation, actually, because he asked me if I, if I considered myself to be free. Mm. Um, and that's, of course, an interesting subject. Like, okay, you know, as long as not everybody is free, I cannot be free. That, that, is, the, that is the viewpoint, and, that, and that's true. Mm. Um, but then he was a little bit pressuring me about it. And, putting his finger to me a little bit, and that's actually not allowed. And like literally not allowed. And I said, you're being a little bit macho and I don't really like it. Mm. And then later he explained that he was from the Van region in, in the east of Turkey, close to Iranian border. Yeah. And he was the oldest son in a in Ashiret, so in a clan. Um, and his father was also the oldest son. So he had been brought up as the prince of the clan to take over. But he joined PKK when he was 17 or 18 or something. And he said, I'm still struggling to let that go. And every time in a critique session, like some, some, some uh, comrades 
tell me this that I need that I have work to do, and it's true. So that that makes very interesting conversation about feminism, about, about patriarchy, and that's also what one of the uh, women fighters said. Like, it's true, isn't it? In your streets, when you go to the city center, that many shops are aimed at um, how women look. Like there's makeup stores and all these clothes shops and all the hairdressers and all the everything aimed at changing women's appearances and trying to make them sort of what you call look better. So yeah, it's uh, yeah true. Yeah, I found the same thing. It was like I I feel like a lot of the Western feminists would be infuriated with you know um, the Kurdish genealogy teachings. I, I don't think they have any place to be, but I guess it's not my place to say. No, to say. no and that's that is what sometimes you know Western and I don't know if you know the Netherlands a little bit, but Netherlands really finds itself very advanced mm. um, and very smart, and it's not and. And that women here, when I explain them a little bit about the, the, the way that this movement looks at feminism and, um, and at patriarchy and, and breaking it down. And one woman said, oh, wow, that's, uh, wow, they, they understand it rather well, isn't it? And I think, oh, that's so arrogant to say it that yeah, way. Yeah. They understand it like a million times better than you do. Really, we have so much to learn. And and there's you know quite some arrogance in the West saying they can't they can't imagine that there would be a movement in the Middle East where they have all this prejudice against that would be more advanced in in feminist ideology, but also here we many people can't think beyond the concept of a nation state. How can you not have a nation state? It's not even something many people can imagine anymore. But I think it's very much 21st century to think beyond the nation state. But here people look at you with like amazement, like they can't really grasp such concepts and still look down on 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 the Middle East and have their prejudice, and that's very annoying. Yeah, no, there's definitely a hell of a lot of arrogance still in the West. Um, did you speak to any of the uh, the higher ups, like the the larger commanders? I know you said that wasn't the reason you went this time, but I was just wondering if you kind of ended up speaking to them as well. At the end, I had well, I had uh, in the beginning and at the end, I had a conversation with uh, Jamil Bayik, so the the co co leader uh, yeah. of the KCK Mamans. Um. But what is an, what is was it an interview? Not really, and I also didn't really use it um, because um, I had some interesting conversations. And before I went this year, I had a conversation with him. An interview. When was that? Hmm, I'm a little bit confused now about the times. But I had one interview with Bayek that I did put in the book. Ah, yeah, that was the very first one when I came in, mm -hmm. in June 16. And that was after the city wars that you also um, reported on. And I had a conversation about um, if that had been a big mistake. Of course, he didn't uh, agree that it was. But we had a really good conversation about that. And also with him. Um, I feel I can ask anything. And that makes it um, also about the nation state, for example. Um, I told him at some point, like, okay, you don't want a nation state. Uh, you want to reach democracy inside Turkey. Um, and I said, sometimes you remind me of a woman who is beaten by her um, husband or boyfriend. And she says she doesn't leave because she says, oh, he said he said he, he apologized. He right. he will be better. Um, we will make it together. But, you know, this boyfriend 
this turkey doesn't want you. It hates you. It wants you to destroy it. It's, you know. So you have to go. Maybe you should make your state and then make it better. Make that one democ democratic. And he said, yeah, maybe a woman has to leave a man that's beating her. But if she doesn't fight the concept underneath, then she's going to end up in the same situation again, isn't it? So you will have to leave maybe to make, that's what we're doing. We're in the mountains, we're defending ourselves, but we have to build an alternative. We can't just repeat the same mistake and think it will turn out better. Yeah, I, I really get your point there though. Like I, I often hear this thing of, oh, it's just an autonomous region we want. And it's like history has told you that that's never going to happen and it's not going to work considering who their neighbors are. You know what I mean? It, it's weird. And also I, I do find if you ask a fighter on the ground what you're fighting for, they don't ever say, oh, well, we want an autonomous region. They say, no, we want Kurdistan. We want our country. You know what I mean? I, I found there's kind of a bit of a disconnect. I do wonder sometimes if they're just trying to be, <laughs> you know, General Bayek's trying to be a bit clever for the sake of the media. I don't know. No, but the fighters also, you want to, you want to free Kurdistan, but it doesn't mean a nation state. True, true, yeah. But and also a, nation state is, is not, also a nation state is not going to happen. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's what they say, like, okay, maybe it's going to take time. And, you know, maybe in the West we're more, we can't look that far ahead. You know, we're more focused on when is our mortgage um, finished after 30 years. Yeah. Or maybe we can look at, you know, the lifespan of our children or grandchildren. But their perspective is bigger and now what you see in rojava they are trying to build this there can suddenly suddenly be an opportunity and and try to undermine the the borders like you want to be you want to have an autonomous region you want to undermine the whole structures of the state that's what they're trying to do in syria okay raqqa is an arabic city and when i was in Eventually, in Raqqa, much later, um, I hardly talked to any Kurds there, also not in the, in the administrative positions, because it's an Arab city. But the ideology is per definition for everybody. Um, so the more you spread that, and the more you spread that in practice, the more you undermine the strength of the nation state. So you can say we want to stay in this state, but what they're actually fighting for is undermining that whole structure. So it, it becomes obsolete. You know, it's only unrealistic as long as it doesn't happen, you know, I mean. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, actually. And particularly, like you said there, it's like for us or me specifically, like it's, it's hard to see that far in the future. You know what I mean? It's hard to even imagine. But yeah. to be honest, nine yeah. years ago, you would not imagine Rajava is still standing now and the way it's working. So that is a good point. Yeah, yeah. and, and a, few, a few centuries ago, they couldn't imagine we would all have nation states now. Right, right. I mean, would they have imagined that during the Ottoman Empire? Probably not. Mm, mm. So, so you've written this book now after spending uh, a year with the PKK. Tell us a little bit about the book. What can people expect to find in there? Well, I really try to take people there. And it was a little bit um, hard to... It's about, it's about the daily life and about the ideology. And uh, because the ideology, everything in the ideology is connected to each other. So the feminism connected to being against the state and being against capitalism. Um, so I had to disentangle that. But it's also, people sometimes think that there's no criticism or something, but there's criticism, for example, about the city wars. Um, well, people have to read the chapter two to find uh, how I... Uh, look how I analyzed it and, and what the criticism is. But also, for example, about young fighters, underage fighters. Mm -hmm. um, I met several who were either still 16, 17, 18, or who were already in the 20s or 30s, but had to like, at a young age before they were 18. Um, and I describe 
the whole context in which these young fighters exist. And there is a chapter about um, the civilian deaths in the in the struggle. Um, the PKK has also during the year that I was there, there have been uh, teachers and some other, I think mainly teachers have been killed by the PKK. And I talked to fighters about that. Also about what that, I say? could ask anything. What do they say when you, when you put that to them? Well, for one thing, like um, they say, we know Kurdistan very well. We know the villages, the towns, the cities very well. We know exactly who is a civilian and who is not a civilian, who are actually spies for the state. So they claim these people are wearing civilian clothes. Jamil Bayek said that too. Like, if I take my uniform off am I, am, and, and wear jeans, am I a civilian then? No, if, if the state would kill me then, they would still have killed a guerrilla fighter, even though I'm wearing jeans. Mm. So they say we know very well who are, who are civilian and who are not. And there was also one fighter, I couldn't really figure out um, who he was, if he was, I, I met him in Mahmur in the camp and he was a fighter, but he was not PKK. He was, he was Turkish, not Kurdish. So I think he was one of this leftist Tico. Turkish groups that cooperate with the PKK, Tico but he wouldn't really yeah. tell. Mm. And I pressured him about it too. And he eventually said like, because I said, you know, you as a Kurdish movement, as an armed movement, you get a lot of sympathy now in the West because you're fighting ISIS so well. And then you kill civilians. That's really stupid, you know? Yeah. And he said, like, who are you to tell us how to fight our struggle? You know, the West is, the West thing is, is selling its, its weapons here, its weapons to Turkey. They're all involved in the war in Syria, all cooperating with Turkey. And you're trying to teach us a lesson about how to fight our struggle and who to kill and who not to kill. Mm. You know, who do you think you are? So I wrote that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and where can people get this book? Well, it's on Amazon now too. And, oh. at, the web yeah, and at the website of the publisher which is left words and it's a uh, it's a publisher in uh, in new delhi because i tried to find a publisher in the uk but as some dutch journalist called Frederick Frederick, that turned out to be a little bit too hard mm. so eventually luckily i found a smaller publisher so and left words are on amazon just remind us again what's the book called this fire never dies one year with the pkk mm. Uh, where can people find you on uh, on social media if they want to talk to you and whatever? Twitter, of course, F Geerdink, F G E E R D I N K, and my website, FrederikeGeerdink.com. There's uh, many stories and more information. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. I liked it. Thank you. Speak soon. That was Frederic Heerdink speaking about her year living with the PKK militants all across Kurdistan. Very interesting there. If you like what we're doing and you want to see us grow and you want extra episodes, more content, all sorts, um, go to patreon.com slash popular front. That is the best way to support us. We do not accept corporate funding. We do not accept uh, venture capital. The only way we keep this running is through donations, through the Patreon, through merchandise sales, and that's it. We don't make a penny off documentaries either because YouTube fucked us. So yeah, you want to support us? Patreon.com slash popular front or go to popularfront.co slash support. We could do with the help and you will get a lot more extra content. It's all pretty cheap. Uh, check it out there. Patreon.com slash popular front. Thank you to our sponsors this episode. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Oracle Coffee Shop in Portland, Oregon, USA. 
They're an independent coffee business selling only fair trade products. See them at 3875 Southwest Bond Avenue 97239. Tell them that Popular Front sent you. The episode is also sponsored by Grindcore House, a pair of independent coffee shops in Philadelphia, USA, one in South, one in West. Find them on socials at Grindcore House. The episode is also sponsored by Propagandopolis, an outlet selling and writing about historical conflict propaganda from around the world. Buy prints at propagandopolis.com. Use the promo code popularfront10 for 10% off. By the way, uh, by the time this podcast episode goes out, we will have a range up ourselves. So Popular Front, in collaboration with Propagandopolis, um, you'll be able to see it. There's four, I believe, prints, uh, all related to Popular Front, that you can buy um, from Propagandopolis. So that is P-R-O-P-A-G-A-N-D-O-P-O-L-I-S.com. Just think Propaganda but it sounds Greek, propagandopolis.com. There should be the Popular Front series up there by the time you hear this episode. If you want to find us on social media, Twitter at popularfrontco, Instagram at popular.front or the backup at popularfront underscore. Uh, if you want to follow me on anything, it's just at Jake underscore Hanrahan, H-A-N-R-A-H-A-N music oh yeah also fuck yeah follow us on uh youtube as well subscribe to us on youtube youtube.com slash popular front i am slowly getting all of the backlog of uh, podcast episodes up onto the youtube as well but obviously that takes a lot of time so just bear with me but that is all there youtube.com slash popular front or i think i've got the domain popularfront.tv and i think that goes straight to the youtube anyway yeah try that uh, music in this episode the intro was by an artist called home and the outro as always was by sam black check his music out at samblackpf.com thank you very much to the following higher tier patreons thank you without you this would not keep moving thank you to tommy pietri james Le- leons kate ellen dan ross thumper lisa milgram lupita valens bradley davies Brendan Crave, Pete Hesher, RX, A. Nicole, Travis Lieberman, Cherry, Ben Marshall, Dallas Dunn, LD50 Seattle, MJ, Meredith Waters, Adam H, Larson 8669, Carante, Bjorn Kirsten, Diamondstein, Jacob, Michael O'Connor, Zach Picard, Todd Cravens, Alexander, Nicholas Butter, Ron Swanson, JD, Jav, Ian Froes, James Colley, Tynan Daly, Michael Akakan, Ethan, Fitz Madrid, Ed Coulthard, Clayton Taylor, Mike Barone, Ben, Liam Williams, Chris Cusimano, Degenerate Zero Alpha, George Arani, DR, Trey Nance. I'm doing them fast today, rapid because it's hot as fuck in here. Uh, I want to open the window again. Uh, Amy R, Rubicon, Frank Austin, Amelia Me, Noah Ease, Christina Rivetti, Freya Northman, Ali Hunter, Moody Al Rashid, Bill Wilson, Andrew Hurley, Vida Provost, Brian McLaughlin, Tom Lochrin, Young Wasabi, Tony Bin, Adam Bergsnyder, JL, Stephen Davila, Anthony Kabarek, Dan Donham, Fletcher Tate, Chad Walker, Diana Govanek, Lawrence Abrahams, Peter McCormick from What Bitcoin Did, Axel Iverson, Christopher Martin, Ryan Sandercock, and Moritz Zumbul. Thank you all so much. Like I said, without you, this would not be possible. Much appreciated. Please do support us at patreon.com slash popularfront.